So thank you for coming. My job is to introduce our speakers, and I'll be the last speaker. And what I'll be talking about is what we learned after here, everything else that's been going on, okay? The first presenter will be my nephew, Brian Taba. He will be giving the acquisition story. That in itself, I'm told, is enough to write a book, and at least some articles. <laughs> Followed by Nancy Ukai, who is the project director for 50 Objects, 50 Stories, and she selected the Captain's Bibles to be among the stories. And third will be uh, Dr. K. Ueda, curator for the Japanese Diaspora Initiative at Hoover Institute Stanford. And she's got some really exciting news. So, and then I'll wrap it up. I'll give a, a biography of the uh, captain, but more importantly, give you a peek into some of the pages inside the Bible. Okay, take it away. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm short too. Okay. <laughs> At least our feet touch the ground when we stand up. <laughs> some of us. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about how the, um, we acquired the Bibles, and it's really from the family's perspective, because right? uh, this is something that was very unexpected for us. We didn't really uh, have any um, expectation to go through this story almost exactly a year ago. And the first this came on our radar was one of uh, the Kitaji Sansei cousins, Diana Matalora, received an email right out of the blue asking, hey, are you related? Um, to Masuo Kitaji, um, who's you know, his Uncle Captain or Uncle Frank or Uncle Masuo, depending on how old you were and um, when you knew him. And it turns out that someone had found his Bibles in the recycle center in San Francisco area about two years ago and had shipped them out of state and they are now being sold by an auction house in New York City, which was a big shock to everyone because first of all, these Bibles have been really famous within the family. Um, people had grown up watching him make the Bibles, their, his life's work, and it was kind of a shock to find it on, being sold online, basically. And so attached to this email was a PDF with the sales document, which turned out to be this beautiful museum-quality brochure, just uh, describing exactly what you would expect to see in the museum exhibit if they displayed these Bibles. Right? Very high-resolution images of the, Bible, the, the pages in the, in the Bibles, um, a capsule biography of the captain, and a description of all of the artifacts, including the, the Bible covers, uh, tools inside, photos. This is a photo of the captain in 1944 for a news story about the Bibles, which is also taped inside the, um, the cover of the Bible. And it was listed for private sale. And so it's worth taking a step back, and I'm just going to hit a couple of the bullet points relevant to the acquisition, because uh, Laura will go into the bi biography in more depth in her talk. But in brief, in brief, he was born in Japan in 1897. He died in uh, California in 1973. And he spent about 15 years uh, transcribing an uh, English uh, language Bible into Japanese and illustrating it by hand in color. And that was the first uh, Kitaji Bible. And then after the war, uh, he started a more ambitious project, which is a second Kitaji Bible. And you'll see more images of these in later talks. Uh, one thing to note is that he was uh, in the Post and Relocation Center during World War II from 1942 to 1945, which was actually a very small fraction of the time it took him to create even the first Bible, and doesn't overlap with the second Bible at all. Two more points. So he married Yuko Kitaji in 1952 after a long courtship involving um, kind of an odyssey from Japan. Uh, they had no children, and she died in 1995. Okay. And that was kind of the last anyone really paid attention to this until these Bibles showed up in 2016 in some recycle center, and then we got this email saying they're being sold in 2017. And so the, the Sansei cousins who had actually grown up with the captain, uh, and he had been, he'd been one of the people who had really educated them and uh, taught them religion because he was a Salvation Army officer, and tremendously influential on that generation of Kitaji cousins. Uh, they were all shocked. They're like, how can this be sold by some auction house in New York City? I thought you had the Bibles. Well, no, I thought you had the Bibles. <laughs> well, okay, when's, I, you know, when's the last time anyone saw the Bibles? Oh, I just saw them right after he died. Well, that was 40 years ago. Okay, well, I saw them after Auntie Yuko died. That was 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> So somehow we lost the Bibles, right? And now we've shown up. 
And so there's one more thing uh, to plot on this timeline, which is uh, in 2015, there is a set of inter uh, internment camp artifacts that went on sale at the Rocco Auction House in New Jersey. And this became a very controversial event because it was uh, viewed as selling Japanese American history for profit. And Nancy Yukai, who's going to talk after me, I think can go into much more detail about this. But the really salient thing for this story is that, if you recall, the Bibles were being pitched as internment camp artifacts, right? even though they were only a very small fraction of the story of these Bibles. And so because they were being packaged that way, um, many of the institutions that an auction house would normally pitch the sale to were the same institutions who had this experience of the Rocco auction only two years ago. And because of that, um, one of them was able to get in touch with the organizers of this protest a couple years ago. And so um, you look at some of the text in these, this beautiful sales brochure, and they're really emphasizing, you know, post and relocation center, infamous internment camps, uh, historical documents of a resonant period in American history, you know, prejudice and oppression. This was really um, headlining the internment camp story. Um, and so it really resonated with many of the organizers of the last uh, uh, protests. Um, primarily, I think, for, for luckily for us, uh, Nancy Ukai, with whom we were um, connected almost from the very beginning and who was instrumental in uh, carrying this forward to a successful conclusion. Because, as I said, the family had no expectation to do any of this, no experience with any of these issues, and really hadn't thought through any of the implications of selling internment cap artifacts at all, let alone for profit or what that meant uh, as precedence for the future, or how that resonated with the past. And so um, I think we got the e uh, Diana, the cousin, got the email on a Thursday. She forwarded it to everyone we read it on a Friday. And by then, we had already con been contacted, um, contacted Nancy. And she said immediately, you need to write a letter. You need to write a letter to the auction house and get the sale suspended. And so she was able to, over that weekend, just recruit two of her former colleagues from this previous protest. Um, Yoshinori Himmel and Barbara Takei, who gave us really helpful advice on how to draft and really set the tone of that letter so it would be productive and effective. And they've all said, you know, you need to get this on their desk first thing Monday morning before anything else can happen. Okay, okay so then who can we actually have sign this letter? So let's look at the family tree of it. There's the captain. Um, he was kind of the oldest of his generation. He had a bunch of uh, Nisei's younger siblings, um, three of whom were the grandparents of the third and fourth generations. And I think there are about you know, 15 Sansei and maybe 20, 24 Yonsei. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the yellow ones are the, one, are, are the relatives who are still alive and you know, adults and able to participate in this. Um, so there's uh, Laura right there, the Sansei. I'm curious, that's me. Right? Um, so we did think, you know, there's a number of ghosts there now, but, you know, it's such a range in their ages. And it turned out that the first two I asked were just, we're, we're not interested at all in this. <laughs> yeah. He's interested now because he's seeing the front row looking at his own picture. Um, okay, so I forget that. <laughs> but what was really inspiring is that over this one weekend, um, through um, email or telephone tree or um, sending someone to knock on the door and wake people up out of bed on the weekend, or social networks like Lion to get in touch with cousins in Japan, um, we were able to send out a letter to the auction house signed by 12 of 14 Sansei and 18 of 22 Yonsei in a single weekend. And so that was just a really intimidating list of names we felt. And um, you know, we actually got a response the very next day. It's like, oh, okay, great. Can you answer some questions about the provenance? And they're like, um, well, we saw him 20 years ago, but we're not going to tell you that. And really, I mean, Nancy pointed out that the burden of proving provenance is on the seller, right, not the family, because the seller is the one who is trying to sell things, and it's on them to prove it's not stolen goods or uh, it wasn't acquired illegally or through other otherwise illegitimate means, right? And so she, for she pointed us to some, you know, very helpful people. At, uh, Specifically, uh, some lawyers in this area. So, Dale Minami and Tan Tanaki have done some really good work with um, Japanese American civil rights, you know, um, going through the Kuramatsu case and others that they're, they're, they're quite well known for in this area. Uh, the only issue is that, you know, they're based in California, and this is a New York auction house. And so, we really needed someone in New York who knew New York, New York state law, right? 
And so we were referred through Nancy's amazing uh, network of activists from the previous uh, auction experience um, to Gary Moriwaki and Ed Shee at Wendell's Marks, which is a, a law firm in New York City. And Gary Moriwaki is actually on the board of the National Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles, which wound up acquiring the uh, Eaton collection after the Rocco auction the last time. And so he, he was very well aware of the issues associated with this. Okay. And so then the advice we got was uh, twofold. First of all, it's a good thing we got the lawyers involved because number one, we were, the family itself was way too emotionally involved to be objective about this. And we felt the minute we took to, picked up the phone and called the auction gallery, um, someone would start screaming. The second thing is that um, the legal case was very hard on both sides, right? Because, okay, someone says you found these Bibles in some recycle center, how do you even prove that? Um, it's, the best theory for how this got there involved, uh, when we did our own research, involved a caregiver who had basically been defrauding an elderly, um, elderly patient with dementia who probably had the Bibles and wound up uh, selling off um, family treasures like wedding, wing, wedding rings and things like that. And so um, it, was, it was really kind of shade, potentially shady the way it wound up where it did um, from our perspective. Uh, the flip side, however, was that um, the title was very difficult because if you recall, the captain had no children. He, may, he did have a wife, uh, and then in California, that means the wife would uh, inherit all of his possessions, including the Bibles, and then from there, it goes to her blood relatives. It doesn't come back to the captain's blood relatives, right? So there's really not much uh, claim to be made um, if, you, if you really push it down the court system, right? Also, it's ridiculously expensive to go through the courts. Uh, we were very fortunate in that um, Almost all of these people contributed very generously of their time, their expertise, their advice, uh, pro bono, right? And these are, these are pretty high-powered attorneys. They've got a lot of experience. They're, they're very famous in, in their, their specialties, and they're very good. Um, and the one exception um, is that we had one lawyer at Windows Marks, the guy who actually was the guy who had to do all the work. And he did bill us for his hours, which I think wound up being one of the best things um, in terms of bringing us to a very speedy resolution. Um, because there's nothing to encourage um, an amicable settlement very quickly, like getting that first invoice from a law firm. <laughs> okay. And so, given that context, the other thing they told us is that, um, right from the start, is that Swan Galleries is actually a very legitimate organization. They've, they're a gallery, they've been around for decades. They're not some fly-by-night operation. Um, right? And they value their reputation above everything else, right? And so the price that they were proposing for these Bibles was, okay, it was the price of a car, right? Which, you know, it's not so bad if it's a Camry, but in this case, they're asking for like a Tesla, right? Which is outside most of our, our price ranges. Um, and aside from the fact that it was also setting a very bad precedent for putting a price on Japanese American history, because that was about three times as much as the entire Eaton collection of Antirma cap artifacts had sold for had been acquired for, right? This, these, two, these two Bibles, right? Um, and so it was, if, if that price had held, it would have been a terrible thing for inflation of um, history for Japanese American community. And you figured out later that part of the reason that price was so, seemed so out of whack with what it seemed like, if you were gonna sell Japanese American history, what the price would be, is that they were coming from it from kind of a European perspective. I mean, this was kind of their first foray into this kind of artifact, Japanese or even Asian American history. And so they were associating this more with these uh, illuminated Bibles that these medieval monks had been making in the you know, medieval Europe um, hundreds of years ago, and pricing it based on that kind of artifact, which is a totally different price range than what you'd normally expect for an internment camp artifact. Uh, neither of which these were, by the way. Uh, so fortunately, it turned out that our, if you really looked at what people were saying, our positions weren't really that far apart, right? The consigner had said from the start, it's like, okay, I found this in a recycle bin, but wow, these are amazing. I mean, look at, look at these Bibles, right? They need to be in a museum or something. I, it, you shouldn't just get them locked up in some private collector's house and, you know, gets thrown away again. So one of his conditions was actually that it had to go to some kind of public, uh, publicly accessible institution. Right? And that's why it wasn't being just auctioned off on the block. It was being privately shopped around to various qualified institutions. Okay. Um, and then in the end, the gallery itself, as I said, valued its reputation very highly. 
And so once we had um, uh, our lawyers call the gallery, uh, we got a better feel for what their bottom line was. And so in the end, the price itself, though high to us, was not high enough to um, pawn their reputation based on this one sale. And so it was much more important to them for them to come out of this um, sale looking professional and um, attractive for future consigners to do business with them uh, than it was to actually make a commission off the sale. And so in the end, um, because of the provenance issues, I think, and because of the controversy, potential controversy, uh, they just wanted this to go away, right? And they were saying, okay, if we could get our expenses paid, just let us break even, even that would be happy. And in the end, I think they wound up waiving their expenses um, because they wanted us to come to a conclusion very quickly. Um, and really, I think this is kind of a common theme. I think this happened last time in the Eaton collection issue too. The sticking point was really on the consigner, right? Because he's the guy who was bringing this to the gallery, and the gallery was really just his, his agent, right? They were being a fair agent to all parties, but he was the one who had the final say. And his position was, look, you guys are so careless with your stuff. I found this in the recycle bin. Shouldn't, shouldn't I get some kind of, you know, some, some kind of uh, recognition for that? Right? And so it turned out, as we were kind of kicking around internally, okay, what does the family think the end game should be? Uh, the first point was basically, okay, well, clearly none of us want to take responsibility for having this museum quality artifact in our house uh, because we already lost it once, we'll lose it again. So we would also like it to go to some qualified institution. Um, and then, you know, look at, when you really take a step back uh, from the initial emotional response to seeing these artifacts uh, written up for sale, that uh, initial glossy brochure that the gallery made with all the beautiful photos, the biography, the translations, um, that was an amazing piece of work. It really um, brought home not only to people we were talking to, but even to the cousins within the family that these are really uh, spectacular uh, artifacts, you know, worth preserving, worth putting some effort into. And the gallery deserves some uh, compensation for putting that all together so professionally and so beautifully. And finally, it does make a lot of sense. You know, if say we had noticed sometime in the last 20 years that we'd lost these Bibles, right? Um, probably what you would do is you know, put up some kind of finders, you know, put up some kind of reward. Have you seen these Bibles? Here's some finders fee we'll give you if you find them for us. And then, at that point, it's not about selling history or putting a price on history. Um, it's about, you know, reward lost Bibles, right? And so once you cast it in that, in that uh, mindset, it's very easy to come to a, a common um, point of agreement. And fortunately, we were able to do that very quickly, especially before the third month of the lawyer's bills came back. Um, <laughs> And so in May, just you know, about six weeks after uh, this all started, we were able to uh, make an a, a amicable resolution with the consigner and the gallery, fly out to New York City to Swan Galleries, that's, that's their, that's their, their uh, sidewalk front, um, pick up the Bibles. And so this is uh, Andrew Answorth on the left, he's the CFO of Swan Galleries, and Rick Statler on the right, the director of American Americana Studies, I think, the, the person who actually put together that beautiful uh, sales brochure Museum quality brochure, uh, holding the two Bibles. Um, I'm very kind of uh, pleased with how it's all worked out because, in, in some sense, getting from their perspective, you know, they're, they're um, kind of semi academics, right? They're, they're you know, selling historic pieces of history and they go into really depth in how they study it. And if they get two of their, um, their, their lots placed in an actual museum, that's like getting your kid into college. <laughs> and so they're very pleased with how this worked out. That's what, yeah. Um, and so one thing to notice, and this is something I personally did not realize until I flew out there and saw these in person, um, is that these Bibles are actually pretty large objects, right? I had flown out there with like my, my school backpack and I thought it was just this little Bible thing I just took in the back and, you know, just took it under the air, airplane seat and it's like, no, 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 it's not clear so can fit in, in, in the overhead. But fortunately, they were able to pack it up. I guess they have a lot of experience with this. They even had these little, cool little handles on the top so you could carry it without having to be yeah. So it was beautiful. So the taxi on the way to the airport. And as soon as I got to security, TSA cut all the stuff up and uh, um, it, it, it was fun. Okay. And so what worked out really well is that this was a week before the annual family reunion on Memorial Day. And so the cousins were able to come back and look at these uh, Bibles they hadn't seen in 40 years, go through and see, oh, wow, well, I remember him um, telling us about this page or that page or this story or that story. Yeah. Um, you see the blue gloves, which we realized we should probably start wearing. 
Um, there's photos with like little water bubbles here that I'm not showing because it's embarrassing. Um, and then we took it kind of on the road. So this is a one day showing we had at the Gilroy Museum, uh, which is the museum, community museum associated most closely with Gilroy Hot Springs, where the captain wound up after the war and spent decades of his life, and very strongly associated with these Bibles, especially the second one, which was uh, created there. And then this was written up, and I think a lot of people might have seen it, actually wound up on the front page of the Mercury News on that day. And then, you know, again, the, I think, uh, a couple of things that have happened since. So over the summer, we had them digitized, uh, and this was very helpful to us. It was done that the digitization was given to us by the Monterey District of the California State Parks which is the organization that administers the Gilroy Hot Springs um, because of its historical significance to the, cap to the captain who was the, cur uh, who was the caretaker at the Gilroy Hot Springs for decades. Um, and then in October, once we got it back and had the one day display, we donated the Bibles to the Japanese Diaspora Project to the Hoover Institute, which Kay okay, will talk about uh, in a couple talks. And I think, speaking for myself, I mean, what's really gratifying to me at the end of this whole saga is seeing um, how much the Sansei cousins who knew the captain and were taught by the captain and were really affected by seeing these Bibles in person again after so many years. And so it's really nice, as a Yonsei who never met the captain, who died before I was born, you know, okay, I can see it at one degree removed how important this was to the family and how, um, how influential it was. Um, so the Gosei still don't care, but that's a word. <laughs> So I just want to say, from the family, a really special thank you to the people. Without the people here, Nancy Ukai, Yoshinori Himo, Barbara Takei, none of this would have gotten started. Uh, the lawyers, Ed Shi, Gary Moriwaki, Don Tamaki, and Dale Minami were critical in uh, carrying the acquisition forward. And I can't say much enough about how professional the gallery was, Andy Answorth and Rick Statler. And then finally, carrying it home to their final res resolution, Matt Bishop at State Parks uh, uh, gave us the digitization over the summer. And Kay Uet has uh, graciously received the Bibles at the Hoover Institute. And finally, I'd like to thank the Japanese American Museum for hosting this event. Wow. Hi, my name is Nancy Ukai, and I want to thank the Japanese American Museum of San Jose and the Kitaji family for inviting me to be here today. Um, Brian, that was just an outstanding presentation. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do is follow up and talk a little bit about the growing consciousness, I think, of communities, especially our community, and thinking about our heritage, the material objects which tell our history, and why it's important to preserve it and to take care of it in places like the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, but particularly when it goes on sale to kind of think about why are things that are born of a tragedy having a price put on them and commodified. So I'm going to just steal the title of uh, the brochure today, Our Heritage Not For Sale, the Kitaji Bibles. And um, everybody in this picture is here today, including Connie Rogers on the right, of the Gilroy Historical Society, and Joyce Kitaji, Laura, who you've seen, Dean, and Brian. And um, the title of today was not for, Our Heritage Not for Auction, which, excuse me, was the title of the San Jose Mercury News um, article about the rescue of these Bibles. And I kind of think of this as not for sale 2.0. <laughs> as Brian had mentioned, um, two years ago, three years ago now, April 2015, um, the, uh, um, um, an auction house in New Jersey called Rego Arts and Auction was about to sell 450 items. And I was part of a group which quickly put up a social media Facebook page and it went viral. But why did we even begin to do that? In um, March 5th of 2015, the New York Times on a Sunday ran an article with the headline, Art of Internment Camps Will Head to Auction. And people who might have seen this thought, hmm, auction, are our items that valuable that they can go to an auction in the East Coast? The first line of that story said, next month, Rago Auction House in Lambertville, New Jersey, will offer about 450 artifacts made by Japanese Americans during World War II while they were living at internment camps. And these are some of the things of those 450 items, 300 of which were photographs, but there were a lot of handmade crafts, 
collected by Alan Eaton. So for example, they were displayed this way in an online catalog. And I circled this first one because the San Jose Museum has a very similar object in its collection. There was a handmade chair made out of scrap material at Hart Mountain. There were paintings by Estelle Ishiko and many others. This one was of, of, um, at Hart Mountain by, by um, the, an artist who was hired by the WRA. And then there were these very moving handmade nameplates which people had made <coughs> to hang on the barracks. And this is a group of around 20 which were estimated to sell possibly for $800. But it was going to be in an auction, so you really didn't know what the final price would be. And then, by the way, the museum here has some examples of nameplates that were rescued from um, a very generous person in um, Stockton. And this photo was by Pam Yoshida. It's an interesting story. So Ellen Eaton is the person who had collected those 450 objects. He was born in 1878, died in 1962. He was a scholar of immigrant art. And he was very interested in, first of all, he opposed the forced removal and confinement of Japanese Americans, but he was also really interested in somehow supporting these people who were confined. And he thought, I'll hold an art exhibition in the camps of immigrant crafts to cheer them up. Then he found out that people were actually making things, and he was so astonished that he decided to visit five of them. And just as the, if, if the camps were closing, he did that. Um, and this shows him in New York, which is where he was based, working for the Russell, Russell Sage Foundation with sign. He did publish a book, the first book on Japanese camp artifacts and crafts, called Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, The Arts of the Japanese in Our War Relocation Camps. It was actually published 10 years, um, on the 10th anniversary of President Franklin Roosevelt's issuing of executive order um, 9066, so in a way it was a day of remembrance when he issued his book. What he said in his book was that when people gave him things, they offered to give me things to the point of embarrassment, but not to sell them. And that was very resonant. So these things are now, which had been in Eaton's collection. When he died, his two daughters inherited them, and when they died, one of them passed it on to a contractor. Um, acquaintance of the family. The contractor, when he, and that, by the way, when the contractor received all of Eaton's collections, the family contested it legally, but they lost. So then the contractor kept them, he passed them on to his child, who is now, you know, um, a, a businessman in Greenwich, Connecticut. That person gave them to Rago to sell, just like, as Brian had mentioned, the consigner gave the Bibles to Swan Galleries to sell. At any rate, the social um, group of us in Northern California were kind of talking about these things, wondering what was going to be sold, what we could do, if anything. And then about maybe 10 of us had a meeting in um, Berkeley, actually, and said, well, why don't we write a community letter and ask a lot of famous people like politicians and scholars to sign it? Why don't we start an online petition? And why don't we start a Facebook page? And we just uh, really didn't know. It was only a week before the auction. And we thought, well, it may come up, nothing may come of it, but at least we will have tried to do something. We're not going to just let it happen. And to our surprise, it really took off. It went viral. We were getting 1,000 likes a day on the Facebook page, which is one every two minutes or so. So for those of us who actually, I, I actually um, became the admin of the Facebook page, but my daughter is the one who started it because I didn't know how to do that. Um, Heart Mountain had been negotiating with the auctioneer separately. Um, George Takei had been getting pleased to get involved, and in the end, the auction was halted on um, Friday, April 15th, and the New York Times on the 17th, which was the day the auction was to be held, had the story on its front page. So I'm really proud and happy to say that the Japanese American Museum of San Jose was um, very much against the auction, but there was kind of a plan B brewing among community people saying, well, what if the auction goes through? We're protesting the sale of things because it's immoral that things that came out of this tragedy, things that people had given away because they didn't think they would be sold, are sold to the highest bidder for a profit. That's wrong. There's also a possible legal um, issue involved, which is if people might, their parents or the survivors themselves who made these objects might have a legal claim to things being sold that actually belonged to them. The auctioneer hadn't established um, the provenance. So 
So there was a sense that, oh, if we can't stop the auction on Friday, we better jump in and start buying stuff to save it. And interestingly, I thought this was very powerful, the Japanese American Museum of San Jose said, we disagree with buying anything and we're not going to take part. Every single bit of our museum from day one has been donated and we don't think that we should give in to this ransom, which is basically what you would be paying to get your own history back. So, um, as Brian had mentioned, um, two years later, after this auction had ended, almost to the day, I got an email from um, somebody who I had never met in person, but had been an support, institutional supporter of the protest. And this is the PDF that came with the email. And this person who doesn't want to be identified said, I thought that you would want to know about the auction house contact with us. This is the Swan Gallery. Um, I don't know who else they have contacted to sell these Bibles. Sadly, it is reminiscent of the Rego efforts with the Eaton Collection. We do not plan to contact them regarding their request to sell the items to us. And that was sent on February 22nd, um, 2017. So I actually thought, Kitaji, I went to school with Diana Kitaji. So I contacted a mutual friend and I said, do you have Diana Kitaji's um, email address? Because I lost touch. And then that person put me in contact with Diana and then Brian had mentioned how that the family just jumped in with both feet and 72 hours later they had this incredible letter with all of these people signing it. Almost all of them were Kitajis. It was very impressive. Uh, and of course this is the happy outcome of that. So I'm going to talk for the rest of the time I have about how you take an object that you've rescued and which you want to preserve and the importance of not only preserving the material item but also the story the history, what makes it, gives it the depth and the context, which it may not have anymore if it's in a garage or an attic or it pops up on sale somewhere. So I'm actually on a team and um, which is doing a digital history project we're launching in two days, actually three days on Tuesday, and it's called 50 Object Stories of the American Japanese Incarceration. We're funded in part by the National Park Service Japanese American Confinement Sites Program. And what we've done is um, selected 50 artifacts. And um, this is a curated selection of things from all the different camps and all kinds of things. And we're going to hope to introduce the object and their stories. And the Kitaji family has graciously allowed us to um, introduce their Bibles as one of our stories and objects. So objects are often called silent witnesses to history. But in fact, you have to um, get the story out of the object. It's silent, but you can't, it doesn't speak by itself. So the first thing, of course, is to rescue the object as the Kitaji family did. And then how do you get that story out? Well, you have to talk to people who are closest to it, such as family members, community members, historians, all kinds of people will come into play that you can't even imagine once you start doing this interviewing and, and talking. Um, then there's the archival research, which can be done at um, libraries, museums, online, the National Archives. Um, it's important to look at, the, from a material perspective, the actual tangible thing. What are its properties? Did somebody make it? Was it a gift? How was it shared? How did it come? How, did, how was it born? What was its journey? What was the migration of both the people and the object? And so obviously with the Kitaji, Bibles, you have Maso Kitaji being born in Japan, immigrating to the United States, and Laura will talk more about that later, but this is the kind of thing we've been doing with 50 objects. And what you're doing is recreating a biography of the person and the thing, and this is an object of trauma. It's a traumatic history. It's something people don't necessarily want to talk about, but it's, for all the re that's all the more reason it's a very important thing to do. So. Um, thanks to getting to know the Kitajis, I was able to meet Joyce, who's in the audience. Joyce, can you raise your hand? Uh, and you can talk to Joyce. I give you permission to talk to Joyce later. Um, but she has a lot of first-person stories about being in Poston and watching the Uncle Captain um, have his magnifying instrument on and drawing and saying, don't talk and just watch. <laughs> Um, I also was, have been kind of going around with Laura and Dean, this is at the University of San Francisco, when there was um, a seminar or a lecture series on the um, camp artifacts they had. 
And then this was a visit that Laura and Dean and I made in Berkeley to talk to a woman, Mary Ann White, who's a calligrapher. And I actually just called her up out of the blue, or I emailed her out of the blue. Um, and it turns out she knew a lot about pens and instruments. And so Laura, um, very bravely, and Dean drove up from San Jose to Berkeley one morning to look at the Bible. And you can see how big it is. And one of the things I was really interested in was thinking about how do you, in a digital site, show people how tiny the script is. Um, it's just, there are no mis they're very, I don't, I don't, you don't even really see mistakes. Um, it's extremely tiny, exquisite writing. And I thought, well, maybe we can have a pencil um, near the page. And I know Kaori is probably very worried. <laughs> we were very careful that it didn't touch the page to show how the writing is so small, much smaller than a finely sharpened pencil. So Marianne mentioned to us that, you know, it could have been that um, Masuo Kitaji used um, a German rapidograph pen. And she showed how 00, zero is the top one and zero 01 the, uh, is the, the second biggest one. And then you can see this unsharpened pencil, how fat it is in comparison to those pen nibs. Um, and the bottom, the um, black set of uh, pens are the rapidograph <coughs> pens, which were available at the time when he would have been doing this. So another thing that we're looking at, of course, is the content of the Bibles. Um, we would have to talk to a theology expert, people who are familiar with, um, well, first of all, Bibles and Christianity, which I am not. But I'm also, I was very interested myself in looking at very tiny kinds of drawings that he made. So this is a tree, obviously, with a Japanese character for to life. And this one is a tree with the character for death, she. And then here, he's um, kind of, you see a cross that's kind of laying on the ground. And it's almost like it's been resurrected in the form of a cross with the Japanese character for a person, hito, on top of it like a tree. <laughs> and then in back of that is a kanji for um, danger or pro pro prohibition. And then he's also made various notes here. So this is just one tiny one inch by one inch inscription on you know thousands of pages. This is really quite a, a project for some researcher. Um, in other places, I noticed he had done sort of writing about, this is a character for man, the, this is the character for woman. So he's kind of exploring the um, visual ideographs for the source of the Japanese character, but he's also tying it, it into um, biblical text. Um, another thing that I was able to do is, I'd been going to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., so I wanted to look up Maso Kitaji's file, which is um, in the National Archives, um, in, the, in the record group 210 for the Dubba War Relocation Authority. So you walk past the statue that says, study the past. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in the archives, Masuo Kitaji's file um, had a lot of interesting letters. Here is one from the, from the Colorado River War Relocation Authority, which is Poston. And they said, this is dated November 13, 1942, Captain Masuo Kitaji, a resident in Unit 2 and a member of the Salvation Army, desires to secure a ration certificate for the purchase of a bicycle. The purpose of the vehicle is to facilitate travel in the work of Captain Kitaji as a Salvation Army and a social worker. And then they said, his work covers the areas of three units of the Colorado River War Relocation Center. The distance between the units is about eight miles. And added to this is the fact that he must travel many more miles from barrack to barrack and the additional fact that there is no more other mode of transportation which is available to Captain Kitaji other than by a pedal vehicle. So this is just a map of the post and camp and you can see it was, it was built on a Colorado River Indian reservation and there were three units. It was this one of, it was, there, had, there were 18,000 people there and Captain Kitaji was in unit two. So indeed if he was going to be going to the other um, units, the other camps, um, was quite a distance. So three months later, there is um, a document which says, we are returning to you the application of Captain Kitaji closed. So you don't know what happened to that particular um, request for a bicycle. Another thing that was in the um, file was something saying that Captain Kitaji is vitally interested in establishing an elder folks home at Poston. This is his plan. After bachelors and persons without relatives are released from the camp hospital, he would like to see them installed in a separate place where care can be given to them. 
He would also like to establish a kitchen for those patients with contagious diseases and other illnesses could eat in peace, and yet at the same time protect those persons who are not yet in contact with the disease. So he had been, he was thinking um, how to care for people who really were having a difficult time caring for themselves once they got out of a hospital because then you're put in a barrack with other people and as he said, you might um, infect them. So this was an interesting thing that also came out of the file. It's a note that he wrote and he signed it and he's asking for a friend from Heart Mountain in Wyoming to have permission to be moved to Poston to help him with the elder care home. This person wishes to come here in Poston and work with the Salvation Army for the elder rest home because Heart Mountain is too cold for her. So she would want to come to Poston and, um, and help us out. And then it had his stamp on the end. He really identified with the Salvation Army and had his own stamp for his letters. The other thing that's interesting for those of you who would like to look up your own family files in the National Archive is there are many what they call face sheets, um, forms, which have a lot of genealogical information about relatives in Japan, especially for the immigrants. In this case, Frank Masuo Kitaji's in the top line, but other relatives who were in the camp are also listed and where they lived. So anyway, I won't go through everything, but just finally, there was a personal property um, inventory, and as he was getting ready to leave the camp, um, you can see here his name, his um, block address, his family number, 32346, and his forwarding address is the Gilroy Hot Spring in Gilroy, California. He's packing Bibles and hymnals, and a bicycle. <laughs> so he did get that bicycle after all, and that would be quite an object <laughs> if it were still preserved. So I went to um, an online database and found this interesting newspaper article with a banner headline, Tojo May Die Tonight, September 11th, 1945. Um, at the bottom, there was an article that said, expect more Japs to come back to Pajaro Valley homes. And in that article, um, they talked about how an estimated 40% of the Japanese families evacuated from this area are expected to return. Right now, the population is only 77, but it's expected to increase. Figures show that there were about 2,300 Japanese Americans in the Pajaro Valley, including Monterey County, prior to evacuation. And in the blue, it said, at Gilroy, so in the underlined in the red, accommodations for servicemen, ex-servicemen, and women of Japanese ancestry and their families will be made available at Gilroy Hot Springs which is where the Cap Uncle Captain lived after the war, um, when it was a place for people who didn't have a place to return to. And in the blue circle, it says, a Salvation Army Captain, Masuo Kitaji, will manage the hostel, assisted by two Caucasians. So, so I'll just end up here, but I, as I was um, working on this and thinking about it, on the, so on the other hand, I'm, my husband um, is a genealogist, and he is creating the family tree for me, and, Japan, so I'm coming up with my family album and looking at pictures of people who I don't really know, but he's, he's finding all of this for me. And there's a picture of my grandmother and my grandfather, Tsune Ukai and Keizo Hiramatsu, and he's my step-grandfather in Oakland. So what's in their album? A receipt from Gilroy Hot Springs. <laughs> I just was bowled over. This was literally last week. <laughs> Um, I was just, I went, oh my goodness. Um, Gilray Hot Springs, July 17th, 1959. So Uncle Captain Kitaji was alive. My, grand grand my grandparents may have known him or met him or walked by him. Um, they were there for five nights and for each night was $8. Um, they had breakfast, dinner, and supper, so they were there for five nights, six days for $87.06. They stayed in the Louisiana cabin, is that right? Um, and so at any rate, this was just amazing and it shows how doing this kind of history, I'm sure before this I wouldn't have thought what's Gilroy Hot Springs, it would have meant nothing to me. Of course, I, I, I had never heard of Uncle of the Maso Kitaji or the Bibles, but in doing this research, um, I've now found a connection to the Kitachi family. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's a map of the Bay Area that came from the 40s, I believe. And so my grandparents went from Oakland, as I did today. They went down to San Jose, which is where we are now, right now. 
And to go to the Gilroy Hot Springs, they would have um, taken the train, or I guess driven to the Gilroy Hot Springs. And so um, here we are, uh, 60, 70 years later, and still learning and connecting. Thank you very much. And this is a good time to uh, mention that May 19th, we're having a public event at Gilroy Hot Springs. We open it up to the public at least twice a year, we try to. It's closed to the public because the, the 20 structures that still exist are very fragile. We don't want them to get damaged and we don't want the public to get hurt because they're so fragile. But we, on the 19th, we'll have exhibitors with we're inviting Nancy and, and uh, Kay to be exhibitors. <laughs> uh, we'll have entertainment, and any of you who want to come and entertain us, you yes, must well, so are yeah. welcome to do that. And, and Connie, the society, and of course, is invited to participate. Um, we, it's not official. We, we've requested, and we are doing our due diligence to see if we could this year make mineral water available for foot soaking. <laughs> buckets, <laughs> literally buckets. So we're working on the logistics for that. We're very excited about that possibility. Because the, the hot springs has been closed for over 60 years and has not been maintained, we're, we're dealing with erosion, we're dealing with the kinds of things that happen in nature when time goes by and people do, don't sweep up after it. So. The other part of this May 19th is we're doing an outreach and we'll be at the Flower Blossom Festival and outreach and here at Nikkei Matsuri on the 29th of April. Mm. Flower Blossom. Cherry, cherry Blossom Festival. I'm not biased. I'm, I like all flowers. In San Francisco on the 14th and 15th of April. The purpose again is to put out feelers and encourage people to come to the May 19th event. We're also inquiring if there would be interest in bus transportation from San Francisco, from San Jose, from San Mateo, maybe from Gilroy, to go up to the hot springs on the 19th. And that would be a time, of course, we have paid seating for that. And pre-registration, pre, the bus riders will have pre-registration for foot soaking <laughs> because of, <coughs> because their travel time is more limited than the person driving up. Okay, no, sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, it's my privilege and honor to meet so many members of the Kitaji family. Uh, we are very, very uh, grateful to be part of this wonderful journey to bring the Kitaji Bibles um, to the current and future generations. So today in my presentation, I'd like to uh, talk about how we preserve the Kitaj Bibles and how we make them uh, available to the public. Uh, as well as I did a, just a little bit of research about um, in Wakayama, and because I understand uh, Captain and his uh, father, um, Kikumatsu, uh, originally from Wakayama. So I'd just like to share a, um, a small uh, research I've done in Wakayama this past January. So it is a really wonderful collaborative project um, amongst the Kitaji family and the California State Parks, and as well as uh, us, to really um, bring the Kitaji Bibles to life. And just to kind of give you a quick background of what we do at Hoover Institutional Library and Archives at Stanford University, we uh, collect rare books and uh, archival documents. The archival documents alone, we have about 29 miles. And uh, we preserve, we have uh, preservation officers and pres preservation lab um, constantly um, monitoring the materials and, and as well as, uh, if necessary, intervening the materials to make sure the important uh, resources are preserved for the current and future generations. And um, we have also a team of uh, catalogers and uh, archivists to describe the content of the materials to make them available online. Uh, we also believe in open access. Unlike many other university libraries, our uh, library and archives are open to the public. So if you are 16 years and older and uh, bring a government issued ID, uh, it's, you will be able to see all the materials in, a, in one form or another um, Monday to Friday. 
Uh, also, we believe in uh, public engagement uh, and the classroom instructions to make sure the, these important materials are um, studied and utilized and um, to really understand the, um, the kind of perspectives of historical perspectives. So when the Kitaj Bibles arrived at Hoover Institution and Library Archives, it, uh, like many other uh, materials, it went through the quarantine uh, process. It, uh, the Bibles were housed in a special um, boxes and with uh, insect trappers and make sure the preservation officers monitor and make sure there is no uh, mold uh, insect uh, activities going on. And so it would sit there for a few weeks to um, clear the uh, quarantine process. And the Bible was arrived in a good condition, so it didn't have to uh, go through this very heavy duty uh, preservation process. But if, if we did, um, if we weren't uh, in a good condition, uh, our preservation officers would have more heavy duty uh, intervention. And we also discussed where to house the Kitaji Bibles, the, uh, because of their uh, high intrinsic value, as well as the um, um, fragility of the materials. If you think about the Bibles, and every um, the page is quite thin, and if researchers uh, flip through the page, it would have some consequences uh, over many years. So we decided to house the Kitaj Bibles in a vault. This is our uh, regular storage. It's also locked, but the vault has uh, extra security. So you would have uh, another lock, and then also limited numbers, uh, members of the uh, staff have access to it. It would also require permission by a preservation officer <coughs> or a curator to uh, gain access to the physical materials. Um, the contribution by the California State Parks for the uh, digital files made this um, possible because we could have the digital files available for the researchers to view instead of touching the physical materials. I understand that was the, the wish of the Kitaji family uh, as well. So um, now the, um, the Kitaji Bibles is now on uh, Stanford University's online catalog. And that is uh, instantly connected with the global <coughs> library catalog system called Wildcat. So the, the top image is from the Stanford University's library catalog, and this is the Wildcat. So this, the Wildcat basically encamp, uh, incorporates all the library holdings in the United States, as well as the major libraries uh, globally. And um, we would have high resolution files uh, made available in the reading room in addition to uh, the online digital collection I will show you a little bit later. And, um, but having the, the physical materials or the high resolution files, um, it, it doesn't really um, do the justice of the value of the, the Bibles. So, the, so Laura actually came into our digital lab uh, with the high resolution files, and then we discussed how to uh, how to make the Kitaj Bibles available as much as possible. I understand that was Captain's uh, wish as well to have the Bibles, um, you know, open to the public and um, really uh, made available as much as possible. So when um, Laura br uh, brought in the high resolution files, this is uh, Daniel to the light. Uh, he actually took a lead on this project. He, he, he majored in theology in college, so he has a lot more um, kind of understanding of uh, how you know, the Bibles work. So the, when the, the high resolution <coughs> files came to a lab, he first uh, scanned um, to make sure there was no virus, and he assigned um, each unique ID number to every single file. So if there is any alterations made to the, the file, they'll be able to detect that. Mm -hmm. And um, Laura is talking to the head of the digital lab, Russell, uh, <coughs> discussing how to, how, in how to organize the Bibles in the digital collection. And I'd like to share Okay, here it goes. Right. 
So this is the landing page of the Kitachi Bibles at uh, Fuvo Digital Collection at Stanford University. And uh, one of the nice features about this is you can uh, share with your friend or family members. Here, this is the share um, function. It's not, sorry, it's not. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, and email. And then if you like to view the item, this is how it's organized. So it's, uh, Daniel had this wonderful idea to organize the Kitaj Bibles by theme. Um, law, history, uh, let me see, move. Wisdom and poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, uh, gospels and acts, epistles, and apocalypse, and a back matter. So let's look at the uh, the beginning of uh, the Bible, Bible one. Sorry, it doesn't like my. Hmm. The color is a little strange here. So when you click on the image, um, let's see. Sorry, I'm using a hotspot, so it will be a lot quicker if you do it at home uh, on your desktop. Um, so you would have this PDF uh, file of um, of the front matter. The, uh, I and mean, then we give um, this acknowledgement and make sure the co where the copyright holder is um, in, in each file so that the, it wouldn't be strayed from the content. So, and then you can actually zoom in, is that better? And then uh, really uh, you'll be able to read the fine prints. So I like this page because uh, the captain talks about the, the Bible and daily life. And then he said, when you feel sad, read uh, uh, John 14. And then when you feel sort of abundant from the world, you feel kind of lonely, read uh, um, uh, Psalm 27, and then when you feel um, like you, you have a sense of guilt, read Psalm 51 and so on. So it's really, um, it kind of gives you a, like sort of how to cope with your uh, life day to day. And um, yeah, and then it really zoom in, zoom in, so you could really have a clear view of this writing. Other nice feature about this is that it's, uh, text searchable, at least on the English text. So the underlying, um, underlying in English text is searchable. So I just put in a job, and then it would show um, 52 matches of John in this particular um, section. And then you can click on, uh, so it was the next John. Um, and then what was really amazing is we all, Typically, he said, okay, if it's handwritten, forget about OCR text conversion. It's, you know, it's impossible. But then, because of the very uh, nice handwritten writing that uh, Captain has done, it really picked up his, actually, his handwriting, at least in English. Uh, we're gonna, we try to, uh, we'll try to experiment and see if we can actually convert the Japanese text into OCR text as well, but it's handwritten, so, um, you know, it's a very experimental uh, project. But uh, right now, the technology has developed uh, enough that so it's, you can teach the computer how to recognize certain text, uh, certain handwriting or ha certain text. So we'll see how, how that project goes, but you know. Um, so that's the, the basically gist of how we organize the, the Kitaj Bibles online and hopefully I'm gonna distribute these flyers, and then um, this will show you how <coughs> you can, how can you you can view the the Bibles online.
And then now I'd like to just um, briefly talk about Wakayama. So this past January, actually last month, I was in Wakayama and um, I thought Wakayama was going to be very warm, but it actually snowed <laughs> in, in January. So it was very uh, unusual, this was very unusual winter in Japan, it was, it's been very cold. But um, Laura shared uh, the documents of uh, Captain Kitaji and his, his father, and we understand they are from Shingu Wakayama. Um, if you picture the map of Japan, it consisted of uh, four islands, the Hokkaido in, in the north, and in the Honshu, the main island, the largest island, in the middle. And Wakayama sits uh, on the main island, uh, south of Osaka, the western part of the main island. And Shingu itself is on the uh, southeastern coastal line of the key peninsula, KII peninsula in Wakayama. So I had a, um, a wonderful meeting with one of the scholars based in Wakayama. He, she's spearheading the effort to help the local communities preserve the, the history of immigration. Uh, some of the local communities with a very high concentration of uh, immigrant uh, history are uh, very interested in preserving their heritage uh, history and in uh, doing some local, um, small-scale local exhibits. So. I brought, I, have, I brought some brochures they have made. It. Uh, one of them is actually made in English. I and mean, then um, I can pass that around too. But this is sort of effort uh, in Wakayama that's going on now. But I understand from this card that um, um, there was an American missionary in Wakayama. Um, his name was J.B. Hale. He was actually an American Presbyterian missionary who came to Japan in 1876. And if you can imagine 1876 in Japan, that was only eight years after the establishment of the Meiji government. The country was still a very young nation and uh, pretty much in turmoil. Uh, civil war just ended and another civil war erupted uh, one year after J.B. Hale arrived. And uh, it's only three years after the, the ban of Christianity was lifted in Japan. So if you can imagine American missionary arriving at this time period, and he had no knowledge of the Japanese language. So he had to study Japanese at the beginning in, uh, in Osaka. And he started his missionary activities in Osaka first. But he decided to um, move to Wakayama and really focus on his activities in Wakayama in 1893. And he lived in Wakayama till his last day, and he was buried there. His uh, brother, A.D. Hale, also followed his step, uh, footstep about a year later. So these, uh, so what I present here is, um, I extracted from uh, his book written by J.B. Hale called 25 Years in Japan. And um, the woman uh, left is um, Mrs. A.D. Hale, uh, J.B. Hale's brother's wife. And uh, the second one is J.B. Hale's wife. And J.B. Hale was very much part of the Japanese community. The, the picture on, on the top um, shows that J.B. Hale is officiating a Japanese wedding. And then the, the wives, the A.B. Hale's and J.D. Hale's wives, gather Japanese women and um, not only teaching them about Christianity, but also taught them how to um, do a Western style knitting and sewing. So that's the picture below a Japanese woman learning how to do a Western style sewing. And um, not only J.B. Hale went to Wakayama, but he decided to go to Shingu. That's the, the birthplace of Captain and, um, and his father, Kikumatsu. So according to his book, 25 Years, years in Japan, uh, um, J.B. Hale crossed uh, four mountains and river to get to Shingu. I would like to share some of the pictures from um, current Wakayama and near Shingu and to just kind of give you a sense of the landscape, the beauty, the natural um, um, beauty as well as the challenges that you might have to go through to go through the very difficult terrains to cross the mountains. So it's, it's, I haven't been there but it's supposed to be really, really beautiful. 
uh, lots of uh, waterfalls and shrines. Um, then now it's uh, this part of the Wakayama is uh, part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So if you are interested in hiking, this would be a wonderful place. But so JB Hill actually got to Ashingo and established church in 1884. And the church, um, the tradition still continues. And then this is the modern picture, the, the picture of the modern church in Shingo. Uh, English school was established at the Shingo church in uh, one year later. But, uh, by the request, by strong request of the local community, and even the kindergarten was established in 1893. And if you can imagine, Shingu at that time was called Shingu Village. So you know, it's not it's not like Tokyo or Yokohama, but even there, you know, people had a very little exposure to Westerners. So when J.B. Hill appeared in Shingu and and um, uh, organized a gathering, like 400 people, 500 people, just to came to see them, just to see how, uh, you know, what American would look like. Not some, probably not so interesting in learning about Christianity at the beginning, but very curious about um, foreign countries and learning English. And so by 1887, they have baptized 110 people. Total member of the church was um, 449. And the students at Sunday school were 353. They had one missionary teaching assistant, five theology students, and the average number of female attendees uh, was about, about several hundred. So if you can imagine the sort of the, the impact that they, this missionary family had in Shingu, I would think it was pretty staggering. I'm not sure if uh, Captain had met um, J.B. Hale, or has heard about him, but I wouldn't be surprised that at least he has heard about him. And one of the things that J.B. Hale talked about is he um, really believed in using the illustrated Bibles. Um, using, uh, instead of having text-heavy Bibles that he wanted to use, show sort of um, pictorial um, guidance. So that's the end of my um, talk about Rakayama. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me later. We thank again uh, what Brian mentioned, the regular, uh, the, not regular, the Swan Auction Center. If it had not been for them, we would no, not have known a great deal of what we do know now. They translated, they looked at the research, they looked at the quality of the writing. Now, if you are familiar with translating, if you get five people to translate one document, you get five different versions of the same. You're familiar with that? So for decades, we were told that the captain was translating his Bible, and back of my mind, we're thinking, yeah, right. How good is that gonna be? And when um, the captain died, there, was a minister who gave his frank opinion about whether or not it was something of value or not. And he basically said, this is one man's rantings. It's not going to be of any value whatsoever to the greater Christian, Japanese Christian community. So we thought, OK, it's just something valuable to us, sentimental to us and the family. That's, he, and it was difficult because we knew that his dream was to get this by these Bibles duplicated so that they could serve the community for people in the same position he was, having to address two, uh, a community speaking two languages. And we, we still have that down across the street, right? That Wesley has, and, and I'm sure the Buddhist church also has something with two languages at the same time. So to have a dual language book, and what he did was face-to-face -face information. Uh, what we're seeing here are some of the beginning uh, pages of his, and initially what an analytical Bible is, as opposed to the Bible you pick up in the hotel, the Gideon Bible, and some of some of the differential differential things he did. Uh, this is the bibliography. I thought it's significant to show this wealth amount, the wealth amount of things, give you a closer look of what kinds of things he, he um, included. It 
tells me that he was well researched. It wasn't just something that he was making up and assuming. He looked at what he was writing about and the interpretations he was giving. He did have a thesis that he shared with us. He believed that the Japanese written language came from the Bible, which if you look back to Chinese history, that's probably not likely. <laughs> but but it was really interesting. He he taught us in our Sunday school. This is the symbol for man. Do you know what the Japanese kanji looks like for man? Or katakana? It looks like that, right? <laughs> and the one for woman? He says, well, this is Adam, and this is this is the sign for, for woman. And you notice this is Eve bending over, looking at Adam's rib. That's where she came from. That's, that's the symbol for woman. We all think, OK. What do we know? The beginning of the second Bible has these wonderful pages. And I took this over to Reverend Yamamoto across the street. He looked at it, and he he said these images. I mean, on one of these, we, we see zodiac figures. We see all kinds of things. And he goes, oh, the zodiac figures isn't about the zodiac. He's using the zodiac figures, the 12 figures, to represent the 12 tribes of the time. So he's using it as an icon. And each of these pages is like what we call an infograph now. I had a another woman who does has been doing um, work with church for about four years, and he said when you're talking to about a Bible passage in the biblical history to someone of an Asian culture that has no context or understanding of Western culture, it's important to put it, give them a context. So she saw those pages, the infographics, as really important to give a context for somebody brand new to the information. This is really funny. It's the book of Ecclesiastics. I'm showing you how he highlight each of the verses, both in English and in Japanese. And this one is really funny. At the bottom of the page, and I don't know why it's there, it's got this little piece about G-O-D, God first, others next, do for self. And on the bottom, do for self, others next. And the bottom is God, question mark. Well, exclamation point, two question marks. <laughs> I've not seen where else. We've seen dog and, and God on bumper stickers here, but I didn't know he did that. Yeah. Oh, and that was the other one there. The same page on the side. He's got a date. He's got other things. We don't know. It looks like little bumblebees or something next to the circle. Don't know what these about. We're looking forward to you who are going to be saying this. Let us know what it means. <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, and here I have some of the pages, and I give a highlight. This is the book of Jonah, a highlight of it. And just above Jonah's, the whale's mouth, he has the quote from a science outdoor magazine about when I read that, the first thing I thought is Pinocchio. Uh, his drawings were exquisite. This one has, I don't know what this drawing's about. It, it's, oh, this is Corinthians. Talks about planting. He's got this cute drawing on the bottom of the Corinthians about burning and then lost. Don't know what this is. It may be the Holy Land in a path of numbers. That was at the bottom of the other place. It's misplaced. And it, this is just in a corner, a little date, and it says G.H. Springs. So he wrote more about the hot springs. We don't know what that means. Looking forward to you who want to. These are the back pages. He's got the solar system. He's got the and this is the very back page, the apocalypse story. I, these are pictures of him growing up, 1919. I think he was California's first hippie. <laughs> he was a music teacher. He was wearing the beret. Later in 1925, he converted and joined the Salvation Army. Our understanding is that he was in a motorcycle accident, and every day the Salvation Army men came and was at his bedside. Uh, my cousin's now, my sister said that uh, our Uncle Bob complained that he had to accompany the captain of, to the Salvation Army uh, things and play the tambourine for him. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Uh, these are my siblings' baby pictures. Conferences happen at the Hot Springs. This particular picture I sent to um, Peter Hirokoshi, and I said maybe you could identify people, but 
got to warn you, they are. He says, and he goes, well, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I could have told you my dad's him standing behind the captain. Aww. There's my baby picture. Aww. Yeah. And I'm in this picture, too. You can't see me because I'm in my mom's arms and under all those blankets. This picture is their marriage picture, their wedding picture. They were buried at the hot springs, and my, when my mother first mentioned that, I thought, who wears black? Well, if you're a Salvation Army captain, that's the uniform. But they looked very happy. And this one, um, the writing down there is apparently the date. And this is his mon, his signature. The part, top part, I'm told, says Kitaji. And the bottom part, I call the dead duck. OK. That's it. We were always told that he had a specially bound. Uh, he had it bound, he purchased it bound with the blank sheets between. Uh, the Swan Gallery brochure explains that that particular company had several different ways of uh, publishing and, and yeah, publishing and distributing their Bibles. Some like, nine or 12 different ways. Good question. And they are lined. They're smaller than collegiate lined. And as we looked at those, the writing was exquisite. It's small, as Nancy was pointing out by the, the trying to figure out how he did it, such fine points. And we think, well, this is wonderful. It's so small. Then we look at the next page, and it's smaller. And then we look at the next page, and it's even smaller than that. How did he do it without going blind? He told us that he made his own quills from feathers. And since he lived at the hot springs, he said, I have all the feathers I want. Yeah. Uh, my husband recently talked with an artist, and he said, pigeon, Dean, pigeon feathers can be, some little bird, <laughs> can be uh, sharpened to do a very, very fine point. I'm delighted to have met the calligrapher who did tell us that there, there did exist fountain pens that were a very fine point at the time. And it could be, on one hand, I wonder how the captain, as a Salvation <coughs> Army individual with very limited resources, might have acquired such a pen. But then again, he's been known to do things one way and tell us something differently. He's not beyond that. So it's very possible he did. Um, you know, he likes magic, too, and he likes having us believe in magic. So, as I mentioned, half of you all are relatives. Do I have <laughs> questions and comments? So my Uncle Roy and my Aunt Edna knew them when they lived at the Hot Springs. Any comment, Roy? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hey! <laughs> So, Roy, can you remember what you remember about the captain? What? <laughs> what do you remember about Captain Kitaji? Well, I, I don't know much, much about him, but we live in the Kirai Hot Springs, so as uh, far, as, uh, uh, far as his life and all that, I, I wasn't very close with him. So. You were doing what young men of your age were doing. You were a teenager, young adult at the time, right? What? How old were you when you went to the hot springs? Let's see, I was about, let's see, I was about 15, 14, 15. Wow. Yes. Yeah. His brother, Henry, uh, was the manager at the hot springs when yeah. he moved to you and the rest of your sisters and your mom uh, up there in 1950. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Roy's mother was the cook, and the sisters did a lot of the busing of the kitchen and um, taking care of the tables and beds and things like that. Um, so, <laughs> well, he was doing what a lot of, did you enjoy living up there? Did you get to hike a lot? Did you enjoy living at the hot springs, Roy? Did you enjoy living at the hot springs? Oh, it was 
It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I bet your brother put you to work. Yeah. 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 It was all right. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, it wasn't a lot of fun to live up there. You're nine miles away from your school friends. Uh -huh. Everybody's working. It, my my sisters were working, and my every and my brother was off playing with the cousins. I'm sure they love the guys. Love that place, the climbing, the hiking, the at that time they could hunt, other kinds of things. They loved it. The women not so much, especially with no electricity, limited water, that kind of thing. But um, some people kept asking me, so what did you do? What you do? Well, I was three years old. And I was thinking, I was out there one day after they'd asked me, and I'm looking around, I'm looking at the sky, and I'm looking at the trees. Well, maybe that's why I'm fascinated with clouds and trees. Maybe. Anyway, thank you for coming. Um, there is a, a pamphlet on the table. It's a long thing that tells you about tours, guided tours of the hot springs. If you cannot make it on May 19th, give us a holler. Um, at least twice a week, depending on availability of a dose set, we have guided tours, and we do have uh, arrangements for group tours.